Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante with Stu Miniman. Jeff Jonas is here, and Jeff is a longtime Cube friend, and really appreciate, Jeff, you coming on. I know you've, you've been on a whirlwind tour, just ran a, or just did a, a, an Ironman, so really appreciate you hanging in there for the Cube. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I was uh, what, 48 hours ago. I was in uh, uh, Cairns, Australia. Uh, yeah. So how do you feel? I'm beat up. <laughs> how many have you done? That was my 30th uh, full distance Ironman. I am. Uh, I have a bucket list. My bucket list is to do them all once. And so, if you go to the Ironman website, uh, there's about there's 32. And they, they, so they come and go, but I've got five left. I got them scheduled this year. I got four. I, I hope to do four Ironmen in August, and then one in September. And at best I can tell, I'll be the third person on Earth to be able to look at the Ironman webpage and all these triathlons around the world and say I've done them all. You That's gonna do four I'm, in August? Yeah, in four countries on three continents. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I'm going to probably work. You know, I love my job, so I work insane hours. So I will work. Those will be only 80-hour weeks. I will work 80-hour weeks and then, you know, put those in between. Just because you got to get it done. And, it's a bucket and, list thing. Yeah, but you can't you space it out a little bit? Why do you got to do them all in August? I'm, you know. Well, I don't, I, don't, you, I don't pick the schedule, you know. I was getting, I was closing in on it, and then the Ironman organization keeps finding new venues. So they keep, pop, you know, it's like whack-a-mole. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what? Japan? And I look, and it's like right in the middle. It's like a little break. It's you know, August only had three, and then they had Japan, and I'm like, damn it, whack. So, so, how, when when do you have time to train? Oh, it's tough. At my girlfriend's house, I got a stationary bike. It's got a flat uh, surface. I put my laptop on it. I work on it while I'm pedaling, and I, um, my girlfriend and I try to chat some too. So I call it quality time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I travel in cities, I go out and I'll run the streets. I don't actually train that much, so I'm not that fast. Uh, what really happens is I just do enough a year. I'll do, I'll do seven this year. I did six last year. The first one's really, really hard. Last year, I only swam five times. No, I swam, what, six times last year only on race day. I had no training swim, zero. And you were saying leading up to the one in Australia, you were um, limited in how much time you had in the water yeah I'd been on the road for a month I had done really no swimming I tried to put in two swims I wanted to swim 30 minutes each but I just my arms didn't feel good so I could only swim four and a half minutes it really it really gives you a stomach upset yeah. you know when you got a two and a half, you got a 2.4 mile swim and, and, you, and you only can swim four and a half minutes because <laughs> you just don't feel like you can swim any further and then you got saltwater crocodiles to think about they weren't really in the water I don't know I didn't see any but and then you had a bike that you weren't familiar <clears throat> with right, so. I borrowed a bike I'd only ridden at six three blocks and i I, uh, I hurt my calf the day before the race so i wasn't even sure i was having a hard time walking so it made it it really it was a nerve-wracking race it took me a long time to finish but i you're there you're just gone here i'm gonna finish it was mind over matter and you're really gonna do four in august that's your that's my plan i will see what happens i set high goals i send to tend to set goals beyond what i can achieve and if i get halfway there it's a pretty cool that's it's awesome, still right? it's still a good place you're right one in august so yes amazing. you know so i got my goals well, congratulations that's uh that's, we're always amazed uh hear your stories and uh, it's impressive you know it's uh, it's humbling I was complaining the other day about I have to do three cube gigs next week big deal <laughs> you know? like, so all right good well enough of that so um, tell us about your keynote you know what's going on what the reaction was uh, from the audience we're here at edge you know second year in a row so it's exciting for me on the keynote today it was the first time it was broadly publicly known that my G2 invention had a role in helping modernize voter registration around the last election. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, ended up uh, registered and voted that otherwise would not have. Uh, yeah, congratulations. Yeah, That's no, awesome. it's really it's really cool. You know, I like, it's one of the things I like about my job is every now and then I just turn around and look at the effects, you know, when you're creating systems like this and the effects are just amazing. And some of the goals of the, of the project, and we worked with Pew Charitable Trust on this, um, they they led all they uh, they led all this uh, election research to figure out to focus on the election rolls. But the goal was to increase the quality of the election roll, and uh, to let uh, sta states uh, have a better understanding about who's moved, who's eligible to vote, and who may have voted. And many people, the, we're a very mobile country, and people just don't know when they move that their just registration doesn't follow with them. So it means our rolls are incomplete. It, so anyway, the, at the end of the process, it just means our election rolls are more credible and it provides more confidence in our election process and more people have access. So it was real exciting. It was fun. I got good feedback. 
Uh, I'd highlighted my G2 invention. It's just a, it's just the tip of the iceberg of what this G2 is going to do. So talk more about G2. So, so G2 is, uh, it's a technology that I, I dreamt it up. You know, I looked at my body of. Well, okay, let me step back. <clears throat> Another executive at IBM says to me, hey, if you had a big idea, we'd fund it. And I'm thinking to myself, I've built 100 things in my life. Knowing what I know now, if I could only build one more thing in my whole life, what would it be? And I went, oh, it'd be this. It'd be this, yeah, this would be cool. It'll be useful, because I'm trying to be useful these days, you know? So I, I, so I went and showed it to my boss and go, hey, how would I build IBM this? And he's like, wow, you'd build that for IBM? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's a funny story what happens next, but basically I ended up with people and uh, and we started building it. I did it uh, secretly. I spent it the first year on paper. I spent the next year and a half doing it, basically still secretly, like a skunk work project. Right. Um, uh, the first two and a half years, the world didn't even know about it. It's designed to take uh, very diverse data sets and, and integrate it. It's kind of like how do puzzle pieces find each other in the puzzle. And then when you go from puzzle pieces to puzzles, you get whole pictures. When you get whole pictures, you make higher quality predictions. And there's, man, this the range of organizations that are going to benefit from this is just really across the spectrum. It's it's everywhere. And I, I think my own personal goal is G2 will one day be seen as maybe the first real context aware computing, like for real. I mean, there'll be some other things, bigger, better, someone will have, but I, I, I hope it'll be seen as really the first of that, of its kind. It's a general purpose, you know, the work that we're doing with uh, Pew Charitable Trust, I'm also doing work in, um, in maritime domain to protect shipping lanes. Uh, I'm also doing work in uh, anti-money laundering with uh, financial institutions, and you could use one G2 to do them all, all at the same time, in the same schema, with the same algorithms, because it's actually the same problem. Yeah, so the alpha geeks say that that, that problem's really hard to solve, that, you know, it's different data sets and making it make sense, and, and actually getting the quality to where you need it to be that you can trust what comes out of it. So. How did you do that? Yeah. <clears throat> well, the first principle is you want the data to find the data. And let me tell you just exactly what this means. For the moment, let's pretend you're an organization. Just you right here, an organization. Okay. Well, every new piece of data that arrives at you, you just learn something. For any organization, every time, as soon as, and if an employee changes their emergency contact phone number, that organization just learns something. If somebody just enrolls in a new, in the loyalty club program, they just learn something. So it turns out, every time a piece of data lands, it turns out that is the question. It is the question, if you want to be able to sense and respond. So the very first thing that G2 does, does this little game called Data Finds Data. And it takes the features on a new piece of data that's just arrived, and it says, how does this relate to the previous observations I've seen? And that's like taking a puzzle piece into the puzzle to see where it fits. And I've been doing these puzzle projects. Sure. Uh, two with kids, I've done two with adults. Uh, I've, I've shown many settings, I've shown the first puzzle project where the kids were putting a puzzle together, but I haven't shown the fourth one, which was done with four drunk adults. <laughs> uh, the, main, the, main, the, main, the main thing I learned about this one is drunk people are sometimes unreasonably optimistic. <laughs> because one of, the, one, of my colleague, one, of my, uh, one of the people on the project would take a puzzle piece and go, I think it fits, and use their f fist and pound it into there, you know? That was the big lesson. But anyway, so it turns out there's a very general way that you can figure out how one piece of data relates to others, and I've generalized that problem. The better of a job that you do figuring out how data relates, then the easier it is to figure out what is relevant to who. Now that, so, the gen, so general purpose context accumulation is give me the features from your observation space and weave it all together, and then it becomes very domain specific about how to benefit from it. See, what a lot of organizations are doing is like, oh, we want to do, um, social media and sentiment, well, let's build an algorithm just to study that. And then somebody else goes, oh, we want to do an algorithm to study, uh, you know, fraud. Well, let's, let's build an algorithm just for that. Well, what if you could actually have an algorithm that allows you to commingle that data and benefit horizontally across it? Talk about, you know, variety and orthogonal data. And it, it turns out the quality of predictions you get when you mix diverse data together goes up. And by the way, that's how you find errors in data. It, better yet, it's how you find lies. Do you want to know more about that or? Yeah, talk more about that. But the question is, how do you find a lie? So if I told you I was 37, well, you'd look at me, that'd be your second data point. I go, I'm 37, you'd be like, you're lying, just look at you. Okay, fine. <laughs> but if I said I was um, 48, I would believe you. if you're I said, yeah, I'm from Vegas, it's hot here, I'm just dehydrated. <laughs> 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 or this is what 30 Ironmen do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so look, if I told you I was 48 and a half, 
and that, and that's a lie. I'm going to be 49 next weekend. So, but how would you know that's a lie? So the only way you know it's a lie is if you introduce. You have to have a secondary data point. You have to have something to contrast it. So this is a really interesting thing about what these sense-making algorithms. Because I think G2, the the way it'll probably present itself in IBM uh, to the world would be end of the brand Infosphere sense-making. But it turns out errors in data, natural variability is your friend. You actually want it. You don't want to polish every puzzle piece to perfection. I'm not talking about MDM, where you're getting a chance to onboard somebody and you better have the account balance right, you better have the address right, and that's your chance to get it right. You're talking about in inferring <clears throat> something. Right, I'm saying now you've got your data that you can own and control that's gold records, but now you've got data that you don't own and control. Mm -hmm. It's data that you're getting externally, and now you're trying to bring it together, and it might have lies in it. Well, na this natural variability, spelling errors, transposition errors, are, are really your friend. You know, my favorite example of this is when you search Google, and it says, did you mean this? It's not looking at a dictionary, it's remembering everybody's errors. If it didn't remember the errors, it wouldn't be so smart. And I got a little personal story on this. My, my youngest son, his name's Dane, um, you know, he's born and I get his date of birth wrong. I forgot his date of birth. I convinced mom, we get his, now, now and then we teach him his date of birth and it's wrong. And every, everywhere he registers date of birth is wrong. And it's off by a couple days from real date of birth until he's five. <clears throat> I order his birth certificate and I get his birth certificate because uh, I'm going to take him to Mexico. And I'm quite depressed because I can see that his birthday is wrong. You got to go to your kid, bad daddy. This is a bad daddy story. Yeah. Okay, fine. It's a bad daddy story. <clears throat> I go to my kid and I'm like, hey, uh, I got your birthday wrong. You know, I know he taught you birthday. He looks pretty defeated, but I had it all set up. I had a PR line on it. I'm like, look, it turns out you're a little older than we thought. And, you know, for a kid, that's just great. <laughs> Five days. Yeah. <laughs> he was two days older. You're two days older than we thought. He just thought that was fabulous. But listen, imagine that. Any smart system would have seen, you know, his, his, his this one date of birth. <clears throat> and the very first time I introduced this new date of birth, that has never been seen across any channel. Well, of course that would be wrong. So what would you do? Any good system would <laughs> and snuff it out. Right. Well, then what? Then I, sh I present it again. But guess what? It doesn't remember it's building up because you got rid of it. So it turns out in smart sense-making systems, you have to let dissent fester. And that's actually helpful in finding uh, uh, lies and deceit in data. So how did you apply G2 to the voter registration? What was the observation space and how did that all manifest itself? Yes, yeah, so what happens is um, states have their voter rolls. And if a state were, uh, states want to make sure that if you've, if you've moved from one state to another and you have, you're on two uh, voter rolls, is it the same person or not? But the problem is each state might only just have a name, a date of birth, and a driver's license. Well, in each state is a different driver's license number. So now you only have a name that might be similar and a, and a date of birth. Well, you can't just use name and date of birth. That doesn't give you a quality output. So then what do you do? So if you just do record, if you just try to do matching, those records are incompatible with each other. You couldn't, you have to have a human and call everybody. Huh? Too many maybes. Right. <clears throat> so in this case, because states have access to DMV data, um, Stay, uh, ver, uh, in, our, in the example in the, in, the, in the keynote, you know, Maryland with the Maryland DMV, suddenly you learn a social security number. And suddenly in Virginia, with a DMV, you learn, you, you, with a DMV record, you also learn a social security number. Now, between both states, you realize it's the same name, similar names, same date of birth, and the same social security number. Well, now at machine speed, you can make a really high quality estimation and make a recommendation to a state. And now a state finds it a very efficient process to mail something out to them to ask them what their real intent is and did they move, you know? And uh, so that's a form of context accumulation, you know? It's often not a straight line between two pieces of data. It's a few other secondary pieces of data that allow you to see the picture. And an interesting thing about these puzzle projects I do, I've done, I've done these four puzzle projects, and in, in every case, with less than 50% of the whole observation space, like if I hide 50% of the pieces and have you work on the puzzle, you can make an extraordinarily accurate prediction about what it is you're seeing. And I, I find that inspiring. You know, it's not like anybody's going to ever have all the data. Yeah, that's good news for yeah for all, all kinds of yeah, yeah. folks. So, <laughs> so talk about more about. Can you tell us more about this money laundering? I mean, obviously this is uh, something that's that's relatively new for you, but and it's applying G2 to, to that problem? Yeah, you know, I, I carefully pick my, my battles these days because, well, I'm a curious person. You know, I stir up all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. But I got to be careful what I stir up. Uh -huh. And so, so I advise in lots of areas, but now and then I, I actually pick a real horse to ride, you know? So I actually spent three, four years on this voter registration, uh, really deep diving into it. Well, it turns out with financial institutions, they have these, um, they have software that they buy that does, detects money laundering and it produces leads. Well, the problem that the, the financial institutions are facing is it's, 
it will produce a lead. Here's a machine. It makes a lead. It goes, hey, I got a lead. It gives you the lead. And you go, wow, I got a lead. You chase it down. I don't know, maybe an hour later, you're like, well, it turns out that's not a lead. But the machine finds another, here's another lead. Well, it's doing this to hundreds of people maybe, you know? Right. It's giving all these hundreds of people leads. Well, you go, I go into these and talk to these people and guess what? You know, how long have you been working here? You know, three years. How often, when's the last time you got to ring the bell? You know, all these leads, you know? Aren't you excited? Ooh, there's another lead. Glen Gary leads. <laughs> these are leads. <laughs> well, guess what? It's like years, <laughs> you know, I've been working. It's hard to keep their morale up. Yeah. You know, so it's really like a false positive engine. You, I don't know, maybe it's better to go random. I'm probably exaggerating. It's probably not better it's than like random. It's like throwing darts in the Wall Street Journal, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Picking stocks. Yeah, yeah, like, well, there's one. <laughs> so I deep, do I deep dived into this, and I've, I've really uh, I'm been meeting with analysts, and I've been, I've been work, I've, I'm really putting enormous amounts of time into this. I've, I've actually personally written a, so far a 180-page technical document, including pseudocode and schemas. Uh, for my technical team to do something that I think is really going to significantly move the needle. And it's just a use of G2. And the, the, the spec really just describes how to prepare the data space in a way to make, to, to feed it into G2 to get a really cool result. And uh, the end result really is going to be allowing uh, the quality of cases that organizations are going to get are going to be higher quality cases. When you open up a case, how you choose what transactions to look at in the case, the, the order of those transactions will be way more interesting than what an analyst could have stumbled into. So the quality of casework's gonna go up and it'll even take less time per case. So you get higher quality per case, less time. And that's a really interesting phenomenon about context accumulating systems. We're going to see lower false positives and lower false negatives at the same time. I mean, what, today what people battle is you move the needle. It's like you move the needle over here, you get bit on this side. You move the needle over there, you get bit on that you said side. said it's whack-a-mole. Yeah, <laughs> so it, it's gonna change. I just, general quality predictions are gonna go up. Huh? You're going to catch more false negatives, the things you're missing, and you're going to find more false. You're going to find more false positives and get them out of it, so you don't have to waste your energies. Awesome, Jeff. This is I love talking to you. It's just it's so so refreshing. You're, this is your this is tired, Jeff Jones. Oh good, I'm on three you hours of sleep. Be, you should imagine when he's like you know really on. <laughs> really yeah. appreciate you coming by and uh, and hanging with us here. I know it was uh, it was kind of an end of the day thing, and can't thank you enough. It's always fun to be here. It's fun to talk to you. You get me all pumped up. Yeah, how am so, I going to sleep? After a talk like this, yeah, how am I going to sleep tonight? Wait, imagine, how am I going to sleep? Imagine if John Furry was here. We'd, we'd go for an, he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you for an hour. But, uh, uh, it's, we'll, your, it's your fault we'll, if I can't sleep tonight for we'll all getting break. me frothed so, up. So, Edge, you know, last, last word on Edge. You know, we're seeing this thing grow. This is, this is great that you're here, right? Not just a storage show. Stu, you want to get a word yeah, in? Yeah, yeah. Be, be nice. Thanks, Dave. Oh, uh, yeah. No, <laughs> great conversation, Jeff. Um, so you, you, set, you set the high bar is what you said for yourself. You know, where's IBM, you know, where's the high bar IBM setting for some of those big audacious, uh, th you know, problems out there? I, well, I'll tell you what. After IBM bought my company, I, went, I, I roamed the labs. Huh? I traveled around the world and, and went and... I would poke my head into a lab and I would go in and share with the lab what I would do, you know, because I was just the new, the new thing that IBM bought. And, and then they would show me the stuff they've been working on. And two things really stood out uh, over, and I saw lots of really neat stuff, but the two things were really close to my space. One was this thing called Infosphere Streams. It's super low latency uh, decision pipelining engine. If I'll tell you what G2 is to streams. If, stream, if Infosphere Streams is the nervous system that connects your eyeballs and ears to the hippocampus where you weave the data together to see how things relate, then, then that's the nervous system and, and G2's like the hippocampus. So, so anyway, I had a lot of affinity to that and I've designed my G2 thing to run in that. And the other one, you know, before, before it won the game Jeopardy, huh, I was talking to Dave Ferrucci, the principal investigator, and he was telling me what he did and I was not hearing the same stuff I kind of always hear in the same space the way that the problem was attacked was different. And, I, and it was different in a way when I went, you know what, all of my spidey senses, uh, you know, yeah, after all these hundreds of things I've built over the years, I went, you know, that's really an innova innova innovative way to attack that. So I have uh, really high hopes for that as well. For Watson, yeah. Yeah, for Watson. Uh, I'm also really fascinated with Flash. I, I'm excited to see IBM starting to make some really big bets on that. It's, it's, uh, it's, I really, I like all my systems to run on it. It's just so, it's yummy. Yeah, I was, uh, it's was just yummy. Me, it's made for guys like you. Right? Oh, I mean, oh all right. that data into uh, get, get in, get in my belly. That's like um, <laughs> Austin Powers, you know? That guy in Austin Powers, <laughs> yeah. Get in my belly. <laughs> well, when you're on Flash, it just it all, the, you know, it makes the velocity better. Yeah. All right.
Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, you know, Flash, you know, it's Fat Bastard is what you're saying. Yeah, that was the guy. <laughs> yeah, like, Get in my belly. Sometimes I think of G2 like that. You know, it's just like, oh, it's really about what is this, what is your observation space, you know? And by the way, most companies could just do a better job making sense of what they already know themselves. Yeah. You know, okay, fine, they might want to go and get a social media feed, but they got the blue puzzle pieces over here and the red puzzle pieces over there, and they're not even relating them, and they're in the same building. You get enterprise amnesia. I don't know if you heard this story. I've said it a couple times publicly, but I did this. We did some work for a large retailer. My team did, and we with this our software, and we found that two out of every thousand people they're hiring had already been arrested for stealing from them at the same store. <laughs> like this is this is enterprise amnesia, right? <laughs> they just didn't realize they got both pieces. So there's a lot, you know. When it says like I get in my belly, you don't even have to look far. It's not like you got to look into like exotic and. You know. Well, but data, databases today are intentionally kept small, right? Because they're so slow on spinning disks. So, Flash changes that. Yeah, like Flash say, is uh, inside, Flash maybe. is sexy. I've like, yeah, give me Flash or give me desk. Storage is sexy, as John Furrier says, and Flash is sexier. All right, Jeff. Hey, we got to run. All so right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So we'll see you hopefully in the other side of August. All right, Jeff Jonas. Uh, keep it right there, everybody. We're right back with our next guest. This is the Cube. We're live at Edge. <laughs>